Mikhail, thanks so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the book. So many wild connections you make in this book. So interesting. I want to focus for a moment on the story of author Yulian Semyonov, who at the height of the Cold War apparently wrote best-selling Tom Clancy-style novels about a Soviet James Bond battling fictional Americans during real historical events. You write that one of his fans is a student in Leningrad named Vova, who reads the novels and decides that he, too, will join the KGB and be a secret agent. Vova, of course, grows up to be Vladimir Putin. Uh, pretty wild, as I say, but are you really suggesting, Mikhail, that jingoistic 60s novels in the Soviet Union may have helped shape Russia and Ukraine today? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's uh, really weird. It's really bizarre. But uh, the facts I, uh, I describe in the book is that uh, one of the little-known novels uh, by Yulian Semyonov named the, the Third Card tells the story of how that uh, Soviet spy cheerleader was fighting against Ukrainian nationalists, uh, including uh, famous uh, leader of nationalists Stepan Bandera. And um, you may imagine that all the uh, all the phrasings of Yulian Semyonov are exactly the same as uh, those. Uh, used by Russian propagandist TV channels. And actually, that novel was and is still the most uh, important source of Putin's information about uh, Stepan Bandera and Ukrainian nationalism. So, of course, the Russian president looms large over all of this. At one point, you even compare a Putin speech on Ukraine to the one by Hugh Grant in Love Actually, where he slams the American president, famously. Uh, you have some background on Putin's reasoning before the invasion, including his sense that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan meant they'd have no appetite to confront Russia. It's clear his hold on reality is tenuous. How tenuous is his hold on power? I believe you said elsewhere that he's got a year left. Really? You know, um, I mean, I'm not to claim that, but uh, my sources say that after Prigozhin's mutiny, uh, his position is not so stable as it used to be. And according to their estimates, uh, um, he's got some something like a year. Yeah, that's uh, that's the, the estimate I, uh, I hear from my very reliable sources uh, um, who were pretty sure that um, something was going on and Prigozhin's mutiny was being prepared for the last um, several months. And the latest display of Putin's weakness was, of course, as you mentioned, Yevgeny Prigozhin, the mercenary leader who staged an abortive coup last month. He was supposed to be exiled to Belarus, but you have sources saying he's been in Russia. And I think a lot of Putin watchers are surprised he's even still alive. What gives there? You know, first, uh, from Putin's uh, point of view, uh, Prigozhin might be uh, not really loyal as a bureaucrat, but he's not a bureaucrat. But uh, he was always very personally loyal. He didn't be betray Putin personally. He didn't want to, to challenge Putin himself. He didn't want to topple him. His mutiny was against Ministry of Defense, uh, against uh, the army generals. So that's the reason uh, for uh, Prigozhin to be alive. And yes, uh, indeed, according to um, to several sources. He remains in St. Petersburg. He spends a lot of time there. He was uh, regularly seen, including um, several uh, several weeks ago, he, he was seen uh, entering and then leaving the office of the local FSB, that's Russian secret police. And even more, uh, we know that he uh, met Vladimir Putin uh, about a month ago. So yes, he's, he's, quite, uh, he's quite okay. Uh, he has lost most of his business, but he is still um, able to remain in uh, in Putin's native city. You recently told another interviewer that you worried a post-Putin Russia could be headed for civil war or even a North Korea-style dictatorship. Why is that? And what would it take to put Russia on a more democratic, stable path post-Putin? No, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, I do not believe that the worst, uh, the worst scenario is um, the most realistic. No, no, I think we, we still have the chances. But unfortunately, um, yeah, Russia has been poisoned by um, years of, by decades of propaganda. And that's probably the, the worst part, that uh, a lot of Russians, I believe, I sincerely believe that a lot of Russians do not support the war. They know that it's a barbaric, uh, aggressive invasion. But at the same time, they, they have that weird mindset. They uh, they truly believe that there is a huge um, uh, conflict of civilizations, that there is a war between the West, the United States, and Russia. And 
and it's yeah. going to take a lot a lot of time to heal that psychological wound for many Russians. So my colleagues and I in the media here have watched in horror as Russia cracks down on its own free media or what was left of it. You were one of the pioneers in the free media, the independent media there. We all know about Pravda and the Soviet era of media control in Russia. How bad is it today compared to the Soviet era? What is the state of the Russian media scene now? How do people get outside information? You know, it's, uh, it's funny that uh, if we compare Soviet propaganda and propaganda today, uh, what we have today is much worse. Because Soviet wow. propaganda pretend, pretended that uh, we are, Russians are on the good side, that Americans are bad and Russians um, have created just fair society um, and are go going to build communism. Uh, and the situation today is quite different. They are not pretending that they are good. They say, yeah, we are bad. We are, we are waging... Uh, real aggressive war against Ukraine. But um, the reason for that is that no one should have their monopoly um, for violence. Okay, Americans invaded Iraq. That's why we must have the right to, to uh, invade Ukraine. So it's uh, it's very cynical. It's much more cynical yeah. than than, so than Soviet propaganda um, used to be. But at the same time, a lot of a lot of people know that um, that there is um, no true on propaganda TV channels. And YouTube, that is the most important uh, platform for independent media, is still not blocked. It's still uh, available in Russia. And that's the, the most important source of news, as well as um, Messenger called Telegram with uh, Telegram channels. Also, it's still working. I'm amazed YouTube is uh, still available there. This interview of ours will be on YouTube, so I hope it's watched in Russia. One last question. Propaganda, of course, isn't limited uh, to Russia. It's become a real fixture here in the States as well, where the Fox cinematic universe and the right wing are parroting Russian talking points. Uh, have a listen to one of their uh, favorite uh, conspiracy theorists, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., now a Democratic presidential candidate, speaking about Russia and Ukraine on Fox. Ukraine, because of our pushing the Ukraine into the war on two occasions, and the, the, uh, in we, we pushed them into it, or did Putin? It, well, let me tell you, Putin, in good faith, began withdrawing troops from the Ukraine. What happened? We sent Boris Johnson over there to torpedo it because we don't want peace with. We want the war with Russia. What? A, what, what whatever. Why are you blaming America's role in this? What do you make of RFK, of people like Elon Musk, of the GOP basically spouting Kremlin talking points on the war and getting applause? Yeah, that's funny. That's funny that for the last decade, Kremlin was spreading that, uh, that um, chaotic propaganda. The, the idea was not to prove that uh, Russia, that Kremlin is right. The idea was that everyone is wrong and that all the conspiracy theories are true. And it's um, it's funny that um, that that uh, conspiratorial uh, mindset is is really popular. But at the same time, you know, yeah, they they are trying. Uh, Kremlin is trying to be to appeal to American conservatives. Uh, may, uh, um, it's trying to become more popular because that's the only uh, plan for Vladimir Putin. He really hopes um, that Donald Trump comes back to the White House next year because that's the only way out for for him out of this war. Uh, he knows that uh, the all, the best way to defeat Ukraine is to have um, to have any kind of international support for Ukraine stopped, and he he he, thought, he thinks that that's going to happen after American presidential elections. Mikhail Ziga, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you.